In April, the Supreme Court of Canada handed down a game-changing decision for Métis people across this country in what's known as the Daniels case. The unanimous ruling squarely placed a constitutional responsibility on the federal government for 600,000 Métis and non-status Indians who had previously been all but invisible in the eyes of the state. What does this mean to both the status and identity of the more than 86,000 Métis living here in Ontario? Well, joining us now for that, Gary Lipinski. He is president of the Métis Nation of Ontario. Jason Madden, legal counsel for the Métis Nation of Ontario. And Kelly Campanola, a lawyer and volunteer at Toronto and York Region Métis Council. And it's great to have all three of you here tonight for this discussion. Uh, Jason, to you first. Uh, we posed the question in the introduction. The significance and implication of the court's decision. What do you think? Well, it's a watershed for Métis. Um, when Canada was created as a country, jurisdictions were divided between feds and the provinces, and they've been playing, um, I don't think it's a hot potato, it's more uh, just a, an avoidance tactic of trying to hide from their responsibilities and pointing fingers at each other. So what the court answered was a question of, in federal jurisdiction, are Métis included? And they emphatically answered yes. And so that jurisdictional wasteland that Métis have been in for the last 150 years is now over, and we know whose door to turn to uh, to get answers and to also finally do what is necessary as a part of Canadians' constitution. is It's the unfinished business of confederation, which is dealing with the Métis people as a people. You use the expression jurisdictional wasteland. That's right out of their decision, isn't it? That's uh, what Justice DiBella wrote, and that is essentially what's happened. Um, this game finger-pointing game playing that's happened, Métis just fall further and further through the cracks. So whether it's in health, whether it's in education, whether it's in supports that are provided to other Aboriginal peoples, it's willful blindness on both parts, and what's that's happened is 150 years of denial. Gary, what do you think that means in terms of funding, services, whatever previously didn't happen that now legally can happen? Well, I think it is a, a fundamentally important game changer in the sense that you know most of I think most Canadians and most listeners wouldn't wouldn't uh, have an appreciation for the inequities that exist between uh, Métis people, uh, First Nations, and and uh, the Inuit people, the other Indigenous peoples of Canada. So, you know, we have been going to the federal government for you know one could almost arguably say since Can before Canada was Canada, the days of Riel to have our proper place in Confederation properly recognized. And throughout the centuries and decades, you know, the federal government has said, no, you're not our responsibility, go talk to the provinces, which was left this huge void um, for Métis people in not being able to access uh, many of the benefits or programs and services that the federal government provides. And as Jason was alluding to, those include, you know, funding for your, your children, your post-secondary funding, uninsured health benefits, um, access to dental and, and, and vision care and, and those you know basic uh, necessities that so many people do. So these are really bread and butter issues and Métis people have not uh, been able to access them and so this decision you know takes that roadblock away where now the federal government can't you know pass the hot potato if you like and say you're not our responsibility. Clearly there's a, an onus in the federal government to negotiate in good faith with Métis governments throughout the homeland on how to deal with these service inequities. Have you been in touch with your First Nations and or Inuit colleagues to see how they feel about this? I haven't personally, but you know, I would hope that you know, the Métis Nation, myself, even as one of the leaders has always said, um, we need to be respectful of all Indigenous peoples. First Nations rights and leaders need to be respected. And those treaties need to be respected. Um, Canada has seen uh, the whole North change you know, with the settlement of the Nunavut and having Indigen uh, the Inuit people have their issues dealt with. So I would hope that that same courtesy and respect is showed to the Métis Nation now that that roadblock is done and, and recognize that Canada is made up of three wonderfully unique Indigenous peoples, the Métis, the Inuit and the First Nations. Each of us has a place in this country. Each of us has a proud contribution we've made to the development of this country. And each of us needs to reconcile with Canada on how we continue to go forward as, as a people within this country going forward. Kelly, I don't have to tell you that not every non-Indigenous Canadian understands or believes that there is great distinction among the three different right. Indigenous peoples. So maybe you could help educate us right now on what you see as the distinctiveness of the Métis people, culture, ways related to the other two. Sure, so I think it's really important to recognize the fact that Métis people are a distinct cultural group. There are many things that make Métis culture so exciting and so interesting. Um, we're known for the sash, jigging, 
mischief, it's the traditional language, and food is a huge part of that as well. Um, I've recently learned how to jig, and I'm actually terrible at it, but I'm working at it. Um, and I think that food and community is a huge part of that. Um, I've recently done a lot with the Métis community in the Toronto and York region, and it's been fantastic to see the youth being so engaged and interested in learning more about their culture and more about their roots. And I just recently did a drum making workshop. So it's, it's a whole bunch of things that are unique and interesting and encompass Métis culture mm. overall. Now, for those who don't know, what's that? That's a sash. Yes, that is the Métis sash. It's um, looks hard to make. Oh yeah, for <laughs> absolutely. I think the oh, I, I missed a recent event where youth learned how to actually make the sash, and the colors within the sash are are representative of different things. Um, you can find a sash that's black that can represent some of the darker times in Métis history. The red, the blue, the green—they all represent different things. What would you say, Gary, makes Métis culture unique and distinctive from the two other indigenous cultures in the country? Well, every culture has its own set of a set of values and traditions, and Kelly's listed off lots of them. And you know, I, I think for the Métis people, you know, part of uh, you know part of Canada's history is 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 also so much of who the Métis are. We're, you know, instrumental in the fur trade. You know, one could arguably we do make the argument that we are the the first drivers of Canada's economy, the fur trade economy, which Canada grew up in, in around. Um, the, the fur trade routes, you know, Métis were instrumental in establishing those fur trade routes, the waterways throughout Ontario and westward, and then when you hit the prairies uh, with the Red River carts. I guess we should explain, Métis comes from the Latin word... Of mixed, of mixed peoples, yeah. Meaning so mixed peoples, mixed, yes. Because yeah. you are a mix of... Uh, First Nations and European, and European originally, but through a process called ethnogenesis, you know, clearly, I, clearly were identified as a separate and distinct society, recognized by outsiders, uh, huh. you know, as a different than First, our First Nations cousins or the European cousins, um, declared ourselves as a distinct people, and we meet all the indicators in, in international law that Clearly, we've identified ourselves as distinct people. Jason, you wanted to add. Well, I think I think that that's one of the fallacies about Métis doesn't just mean to mix. There's these distinct communities that emerged in Canada prior to Canada becoming Canada. So as Canada went westward, um, it wasn't just a bulldozer. There were communities there that pushed back. And whether it's um, in Micah Bay and Sault Ste. Marie in 1850, or whether it's in the Red River, these communities, uh, of, with their own history, identities, and cultures, essentially were here prior to Canada becoming Canada. And that's the problem. People do think it's the bulldozer. People don't understand that, People think it's uh, the... that this bulldozer came westward, right? Oh. And then we're all Canada. What well, Canada is this wonderful experiment of reconciling diversity within unity. Mm -hmm. And the stories of the Métis, First Nations, and Inuit aren't told. There's, there's that, that um, we're, I think we're going through a rebalancing. The court uses the language of reconciliation, but it's owning our truths of what this country was based upon. And I think one of this country's original sins is how Aboriginal peoples were dealt with. And the Daniels decision allows the platform for those discussions uh, of a relationship interrupted or never began to finally begin with the Métis. Hmm. Kelly, I want to ask you about a time before you were born. Because I think it's fair to say before you were born, many Métis people in Canada hid their identity. Oh, they absolutely. did not want to be known as Métis. Mm -hmm. Why not? I think it's, it's really hard for people because part of colonization was to make people assimilate and to not be proud of their culture. So, you know, in, in workplaces, you, people weren't encouraged and weren't told to celebrate, celebrate their ancestry. In fact, they probably were discriminated against because of their ancestry. And, um, a well, tell us about your grandfather. Yeah, I was just gonna say a perfect hmm. example for me is my grandfather. He played in the NHL for the Bruins as well as the Detroit Red Wings. What was his name? Real Sheverfist. Okay. And no one knew he was Métis. In fact, he hid it. So it was kind of something that, you know, he has fans everywhere across Canada. And it's quite funny that they still exist. But yeah, the fact none of them know that he's Métis. And I guess this is kind of like a coming out moment for him. And Well, he has a kind of a Francophone name. So you might not assume that he was Métis. Right. And why did he not want to give up that identity to his teammates or to other people at the time? I think it's hard to say because he, he died before I was born. Um, he struggled really with alcoholism and I think it's kind of goes to the intergenerational impacts that our people face when 
you're told not to be your true self and to hide your identity, um, it comes out in some ways. You know, it's going to come out one way or the other. And embracing your true self and being able to celebrate your culture is one part of reconciliation. And we're getting there slowly and surely. And I think that the Daniels decision is one step further to opening those doors to true reconciliation. And I mean, maybe if it was a different day and my grandfather was alive today and he was playing in the NHL today, he'd be a proud Aboriginal man. He'd be proud and he'd be rich. Yeah. Yeah, that's another thing. <laughs> let's, uh, let's follow up on that cultural awakening. We've got some stats here. Sheldon, if you would, let's put these up here and we'll share them with our audience. Between 1996 and 2006, the Métis had the highest growth rates of all Aboriginal identity groups. Their population nearly doubled. Then between 2006 and 2011, it rose by 16%. In 2011, we've got almost half a million people identifying themselves as Métis. They represented about a third of the total Aboriginal population and 1.4% of the total Canadian population. The largest population of Métis is in Alberta, nearly 100,000, followed by, yes, right here in the province of Ontario, more than 86,000. Métis currently have the highest employment rate and highest rates of post-secondary completion among all Indigenous Canadians. Which leads me to Jason and asking the question, why do you think today more and more Canadians are prepared to identify themselves as Métis, unlike in the time of uh, Kelly's grandfather? I think it's like cases like the Daniels case, cases like the Powley case. There is this uh, reawakening or this honesty about Aboriginal people are not something to be uh, you know, discriminated against or not respected for being the first peoples or founding uh, partners in confederation. Um, there's a renewed pride. And so you have the next generation like Kelly and uh, even myself. I still remember going to grade school and learning that, you know, Riel was crazy and his people were traitors against Canada. Um, that's... Where'd you go to school? Uh, Thunder Bay. And that was that was the textbook in grade eight at the time. And, and so that... That's and not that long ago. That is not that long ago. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm only 40. Um, but, uh, but, it, but, but, that is, but that is the narrative. And I think that what these cases and what is happening happening, whether it's the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples or the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, is we're finally telling the true story of Canada. And, um, and I think that because of that, people then look and say, well, I don't have to be ashamed. I don't need to hide. And they're coming, and these communities didn't go away. They may have went underground, but that culture, that language, that identity still is there. And I think um, now we're in a, in a stage of it's, whether it's a renaissance or whether it's a reawakening, that people are more and more coming forward. Gary, where are you born? Fort Francis, Ontario. Fort Francis, okay, yes. northwestern Ontario. Northwest Ontario, yeah. Uh, I'm not going to call you the oldest person here. I'll call you the most experienced <laughs> and seasoned person among our gathering here. Well, thank you Was for that. Was there a time in your life when you um, felt less proud of your background? Well, I was, I was fortunate enough, I guess, to grow up in a large extended family. So I had five, five uncles and a, an aunt and, and, you know, probably 40 or 50 cousins, but, you know, and who all lived in very close, close proximity. And so I've always had that, you know, large family support. And then even if I get into the second cousin and that, you know, it gets into the hundreds pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And so growing up in a small town, um, we all knew who we were. And, and, and I, th I think we were living the lifestyle more than we were, you know, fl you know flying the Métis flag. You know, many of my uncles uh, were, were trappers and, and uh, all their whole lives were com Métis commercial fishermen. Was Louis, it, Louis Riel a hero in your home? Um, he was uh, certainly, you know, recognized as somebody who, who you know, obviously fought for and defended Métis. Um, but in all honesty, even in my earlier days, it wasn't about politics. It was going out and enjoying and living the Métis life. Hmm. Um, so I wasn't politically involved in my earlier days. But, uh, but you know, the family was living it. And I think that's what's, in, you know, ultimately that's where, you know, as a Métis leader, I like to bring things back. You know, we're talking about a Daniel decision. Often I find too much can get lost in, you know, the political legal analysis of those decisions. We always have to, in my view, try and bring it back to how does this affect people on the ground? You know, what are the practical realities of what's trying to be accomplished through these court cases? Or what is the objective to make a difference in people's lives? Well, at the risk of getting entangled in more legalese, I actually am going to read an excerpt now from another Supreme right. Court decision. This is not from the Daniels case, but another one five years ago. And here's the excerpt from the Supreme Court of Canada. Cunningham versus Alberta. The history of the Métis is one of struggle for recognition of their unique identity as the mixed race descendants of Europeans and Indians. Caught between two larger identities and cultures, the Métis have struggled for more than two centuries for recognition of their own unique identity, culture, and governance. And now I get to ask a really politically incorrect question that you all probably know is coming. Okay, Kelly, you first. 
Do, <laughs> ladies first. <laughs> do, do people ever look at you and say, hmm, you sure don't look Métis. Oh my gosh, every day. All the time. Oh yeah, because um, I am not shy about sharing either, and people are not shy at all, equally so, to say, you're lying. You can't be telling the truth. There's no way you're Aboriginal. What do they think you are? Just Canadian, maybe. Mm. I've gotten a slew of things, including uh, Spanish. <laughs> like, it goes across the board. But okay. I think the really interesting point when it comes to that is that typically I've never received that type of comment in from an, someone within the Indigenous community. When I say I'm AT, I will never have a friend of mine who's First Nations or Inuit be like, I don't really believe you. They accept it. it absolutely. I feel like I kind of get those comments personally from other people who aren't identified, who don't identify as Aboriginal and who are, you know, probably trying to make light of the situation or, you know, learn more about my background or where I'm from. But at the same time, I can't say that that comment isn't hurtful. Mm. W would you, uh, okay, let's just go for this here. Would you acknowledge that you don't look like what most people typically think a Métis is supposed to look like? Absolutely, because when you think of Métis in public media, it's rarely a topic of conversation. Um, media for Métis people by Métis people comes usually from the MNO. And it's kind of, we're just seeing this new resurgence of Aboriginal people being talked about in the popular media and programs like the agenda that are talking about Aboriginal people and their accomplishments in a positive light. I think for me, it's only been since the Olympics that I've kind of seen things shift, hmm. but it's very new. So I don't really blame people either with the lack of education that they receive. And I think there's there's a misunderstanding. Métis don't have a specific phenotype or a, mm. or a look. Um, they are polities, they are peoples, they are communities. And similar to how there's not one look for the Quebecois, there are these people who share a common culture, identity, history. No, I hear you, Jason, that, but there is a there there is a quote unquote look that people think of when they think of indigenous Canadians. And, and you think, don't have that look. I, and I think that but many First Nations who may live on and off reserve don't have that look either. And I think that bias, we need mm -hmm. to talk about it. We need yeah. to own it because that is so that that less than Aboriginal or not quite Aboriginal um, that is not who these peoples or these polities are. And that's not who the courts are. This is not a race-based quantum, mm. blood quantum analysis. That's what the Indian Act imposed upon people, but that's not what those communities are. And those communities are bound together not by um, blood quantum, they're bound together by history, culture, identity, and way of life. And that is how they accept themselves, and that's where it starts, and then others need to accept that. But do you, do you operate from the assumption that people are not intended to be racist, they just, they don't know? Exactly, I, and, I, and I think that that's the process of reconciliation. We need to have more discussion about that so people understand what these communities are of, oh well, is the goal of Métis to become First Nations? Absolutely not. These are unique, distinct his, uh, communities that are emerged along the waterways of the fur trade and that they have their own story and also aspirations. The goal also isn't to establish Métis reserves in all sorts of locations. The uh, desire is to actually sit down and negotiate how do we find our proper place within Confederation. Gary, have you ever had your Métis ancestry questioned? Uh, yes, yeah, actually all the time. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're dark skinned or, uh, or light skinned, you know, people always um, use some uh, you know they'll they come in with these preconceived notions. So, and I'll give you you know opposite extremes. So one of the I was continue to get a chuckle of this one time down here in Toronto. I went to a, we used to go to this nice little mom and pop Italian restaurant. It's beautiful beautiful woman, elderly woman. And uh, so I, <clears throat> one day I was paying with the credit card, and she looks at the credit card and she looks at me and she looks at this and she's. Why does an Indian have a Ukrainian name? <laughs> First of all, my dad would be upset because it's not a Ukrainian name either. Uh, his ancestry, his parents were Polish immigrants, and my ancestry, Métis ancestry comes from my mother's side, and, and we're not First Nations. Um, so she got it wrong on both accounts, but it's those types of things. And then, but again, uh, you're, did you take offense at that? No, I just, I just kind of laughed at it because you know this sweet young woman certainly didn't mean any offense mm -hmm. by it. But it shows you the stereotype, the views that some people have. Exactly. Then the other extreme is that sometimes I would go up to you know the north northwestern part of the province where I live, you know, pull into a First Nations gas bar or whatever to fill up, and then you know have some a young fellow mean, well, you just want to be Indian, 
And so you get it from that side too because you know there's a perception that you're Métis while you're less than something and you're trying to be. And you know you're not trying to be First Nations. We are proud of who we are. We have a very rich, proud culture, history. We've contributed so much to the building of, of uh, the provinces and communities throughout Canada. And that's the work that continues to be in front of the Métis Nation, is telling our story, telling our history. Mm -hmm. That's part of the, you know, why we're misunderstood sometimes, is, is Canadians really don't know how Métis contributed so much to the building of the communities, provinces, and countries. That's the narrative we need to get out there. And, and Kelly was hitting on something that, um, that I think is important, is that media doesn't pay a lot of attention to the Métis, Métis issues. Um, your, your stats showed that you know we're one third of Ontario's you know Métis pop, uh, Aboriginal population, mm -hmm. 86,000. There's something like 46,000 on reserve First Nations, and you do any analysis you want of the amount of programming, the amount of time, the amount of tension, the amount of funding that goes towards that group, and put it compare it to anything else, and I think anybody would be blown away. Now that's not to say that First Nations have some very uh, serious and, and an issue, those issues need to be dealt with, there needs to be support put in place for them. But do a comparative analysis. You've got 46,000 on reserve, you've got 86,000 Métis people living in this province, and in any model you will see that the Métis come up short on all well, fronts. Well, having said that, would you acknowledge that their issues and their problems right now are infinitely more perilous than yours are? I mean, you don't have an Adam, I don't have, I think, back uh, Absolutely. I, I, some of this, the issues First Nations leadership has to deal with are extreme and urgent. I, I give them full credits and the, and the province and the feds need to deal with those urgently. Hmm. But at the same time, you know, you can't continue to ignore that Métis yeah. are one of you indigenous want your place peoples. At the table. Well, and, and another you know, thing that, that gets us upset quite often is, again, the misconception that Métis people don't pay taxes. Um, and therefore, you know, this, well, what are they, they get everything for free anyways. Well, we don't, our children don't get access to post-secondary education. We don't get access to those uninsured health benefits and, and all the other programs that are available through the federal government. Yet Métis people pay uh, income tax, property tax, sales tax, death tax, GST, and every other tax you can imagine. <laughs> and we don't receive the benefits of those programs back. Those fundings do not come back to support the needs of our people. Well, maybe they will now with this court decision. We'll let's see. Let's hold off on that for a second. <laughs> Let me ask, since I've asked a couple of weird questions already, I'm going to ask another one. Have you ever had a moment where you kind of, and, and I don't really know what this means, but let's try it anyway, where you kind of wished you looked more stereotypically Aboriginal so that people would actually believe you when you said, I really am? I think for me it was kind of an evolution. Um, I wasn't very much very in touch with my culture growing up in high school. I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that I was reading textbooks about Louis Rial being a trader, and my mother was always saying, you know, you need to come to community events with me, you need to do this, you need to do that. I was like, Mom, can you let it be? Like, can you just let me do my thing? But after I went to post-secondary education and had the opportunity to learn the true history of, between Canada and Aboriginal people, I kind of had an awakening and said, oh my gosh, I need to get into the opinion, I need to learn more about my people, I need to contribute in any way that I can, and I think I was because I was so new, I felt just insecure in general, and I wor wondered what my place was in the Indigenous community, and I worried that I wasn't, to draw on what Jason said, Aboriginal enough. Hmm. You're from Porcupine, eh? Yes. Where is that? It's near Timmins, Ontario. Near Timmins. Yes. Now, the best of my knowledge, there is no university in Porcupine. No. So I, where did you go? I went to Wilfrid Laurier in Waterloo. Okay. Yeah. That's so, a long way from home. Yeah, absolutely, and that's a struggle facing a lot of our youth is that you know, we want youth to be going to Aboriginal resource centers once they decide to leave their remote northern communities. And having a fear of being not Aboriginal enough or not being welcome is something that a stereotype or a feeling that needs to be smashed. And I think conversations like this and talking about it will reinforce the fact that Métis people are Aboriginal enough. You do deserve a seat at the table. You should be involved in the conversation and you shouldn't ever worry about that. Hmm. Uh, and again, since I'm on a roll here with weird questions, you, you can convert to Judaism, you can convert to Catholicism, you can, you know, you can assume the citizenship uh, if you move to another country and become a citizen of that country. C if you're not born Métis, can you become Métis? Uh, no, <laughs> I think that, that that is the, but but the communities themselves determine who their citizens are within international standards and the Pauli test uh, from the Supreme Court of Canada um, sets out self-identification, community acceptance, as well as ancestral connection, not necessarily specific blood quantum. Um, and I think that the Métis themselves have adopted that and they're flexible in how they apply that. But I think that, um, you know, Métis are not just anyone who is 
is mixed blood. I think that that's a common, as you started with, mm -hmm. misconception that these communities themselves have the right to determine their own um, citizenship, and they are, and through the Métis Nation of Ontario's registry, as well as uh, work going on throughout the Métis Nation, the Métis do that. They never want to be have someone have control over that, like the Indian Act, but they also do have their own objectively verifiable systems to identify their citizens. Okay, I do remember in this very studio, geez, I don't know how long ago it is now, eight, nine years ago or so, John Ralston Saul came in here to talk about his book, A Fair Country. And here's one of the, and of course you know the, uh, the premise of his book, which I'm going to read right now. He wrote, We are a Métis civilization. What we are today has been inspired as much by four centuries of life with the indigenous civilizations as by four centuries of immigration, as have Métis people. Canadians in general have been heavily influenced and shaped by the First Nations. A few things to unpack here. Gary, how did you, first of all, how did you feel about him describing all of Canada, essentially, as a Métis nation. Well, I, I, I like to take the good in what he was saying and the good we have within the Métis nation and say, well, <clears throat> well that's quite the compliment to the Métis nation. Um, and maybe it, it draws on some stuff. Like, within the Métis nation of Ontario, I think, you know, people watched our government, our governance in action. I think they'd be quite surprised, and maybe it's a trait that Parliament can pick up on further. But most of our resolutions when we go to our assembly and our provincial meetings or whatever are passed by consensus. And so we'll discuss the issue, we'll just debate it, and have good serious debate on it. Um, and then when ultimately it comes to a vote, you know, more often than not at our assemblies and our PCMO meetings, it's by consensus um, mm -hmm. the way we do business. And so I, you know, if he's picking up on some of the, the, the better qualities we, we have within the Métis Nation, then I, I applaud that comment. What do you think of that? We're a Métis Nation. I think I worry that generally people have such a, a baseline understanding of Aboriginal people in general and the distinctions between the three groups that saying that can be very confusing. Um, well, I think what he meant by it was, you know, there, there's a kind of a sharingness uh, community right. in Canada, but, as but, evidenced by Medicare in a way. Yeah, but, but I think one of the things that he, he's missing within that concept, though, is that there's a birth. Ethnogenesis means birth of a distinct culture. And the concept that we're just this mix of half of this, half of that, undermines the concept of that we're something anew and completely distinct. I think in his, the, the theory that he's uh, espousing of, well, we have to recognize that this is a part of who we are, underlying as a foundation of Canada. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Yeah. I think using Métis as the moniker um, to essentially do that uh, conflates the concept between just simply something that's mixed and something that is completely hmm. distinct. Gary, you stepping down? I am. MNO's elections are happening right now. In fact, May 2nd, so I hope everybody's getting out and voting for, uh, for the candidate of choice. You've and been president for eight years. I've been president for eight years. Um, what would you say your most uh, happy achievement is in that time? Well, not only I've been president for eight, but I've been on, on the provincial council for more than two decades. So I've, I've seen and, and I've joined MNO when it first created in 1993. So I've seen a, a tremendous evolution. Um, but in my tenure as president, uh, you know, I think there's a number of things I'm most happy and proud of. And, and I've, you know, I just look at watching Kelly, uh, you know, answer your questions and, and, you know, a lawyer by profession and, and telling her story. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's so much of what MNO is about. It's, you know, we put a lot of focus on supporting children and youth to be the best they can be. And uh, your stats bore witness to the fact that Métis, uh, the Indigenous people are, you know, are some of the, you know, we still got a long way to go, but are reaching... What's the uh, biggest challenge for your successor, if you've got a long way to go? Well, I think I don't, uh, there'd be challenges, uh, but I, opportunities. I really see opportunities with the Daniel decision coming down. You know, the, the courts have basically all but told the government they need to develop a, a Métis land claims process to deal with our historic grievances. Mm -hmm. Getting tables for uh, having... Um, proper programs and services that uh, we talked about, you know, that are available to other Indigenous peoples, available to our people. Those are bread and butter issues that mean a lot to our, to the people on the ground. So let me ask Jason about that. You're going to start, or somebody's going to start uh, from the Métis world, negotiating with the Government of Canada uh, as a result of this Daniels decision. Yeah. How do you think that's going to go? I think that uh, the past already there. They've done it for the Inuit. Up until the 1950s, they had no relationship with the Inuit. Now we're witness to four modern-day land claims agreements and the creation of Nunavut. We know how this plays out. Uh, there needs to be modern-day treaties or agreements with the Métis. We've done the trifecta over the last decade. Powley in 2003, the Manitoba Métis Federation land claim case in 2013, and Daniels is the final obstacle that's been put before us. The table's now set. It's now for uh, Trudeau to follow up on his commitment to say we're going to engage in nation-to-nation -nation relationships. Well, the courts have been there for a long time. Now it's ready time for the federal government to be there as well. Can you imagine in the province of Ontario in our lifetime 
a Métis reserve. I'm not necessarily sure it's going to be a reserve, but I do see a land base for Métis, whether it's for cultural, whether it's for economic purposes. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about that. There is going to have to be reconciliation with the Métis. That's what Justice Abella in the unanimous decision says. Get on with it. We, there is no more underbrush. You can't, you know, close the wickets and uh, pretend no one's at the door anymore. You are responsible. And believe me, if they don't come and open the door, the Métis will kick it in. I want to thank all of you for coming in and helping us out with this. Kelly Campanola, Métis lawyer. Gary Lipinski, President, Métis Nation of Ontario. Jason Madden, Métis lawyer, legal counselor for Métis Nation of Ontario. Great to have you all on TVO tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.